So, um, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the first day of Design Fictions, Future Epidemiologies, Ethical Responses, and Public Health, a studio session series presented by the UC San Diego Design Lab and the Visual Arts Speculative Design Program. I'm Stephanie Sherman, a PhD candidate in VizArt Spec Design and a designer with both the Design Lab Automation and Community Teams. And so I'm especially thrilled to bring together these entities and initiatives that I've worked with for many years today. Um, the UC San Diego Design Lab is a center for human and user-centered design research, education, and community development, focused particularly on design for large-scale socio-technical systems. And the Visual Arts Speculative Design Program is a track within the Visual Arts Department that brings together art, media, and design futuring methods. We'll hear much more from Benjamin today and over the course of the series about what speculative design is, what design fictions is, and how design fictions inform responses to the current public health crisis, um, many of which are perhaps feeling more like reality or feeling less like reality and more like fiction um, with each passing day. Um, the goal for these studio sessions, of course, is to introduce new ideas and practical working methods um, that have real world applications. And this series in particular responds to a number of inquiries that have been at the forefront of conversations with the design lab this year. How to design for the redistribution of power, how to design against privilege and bias, how to support ethical responses to complex situations across scales. Um, I've had the pleasure of co-producing this series with my fellow visual arts PhD candidate, Jonah Gray, under the curatorial le leadership of Lisa Cartwright and by the instigation of the Design Lab's Camille Nebenecker, um, and who will both host sessions the third and fourth week respectively. So thanks again to the Design Lab and the Visual Arts Department for their support. Um, we have folks joining us today from undergrads, faculty, staff at UCSD and beyond. And so in the spirit of interdisciplinarity, we, ask, we encourage you to ask questions, seek clarification for things that don't make sense, but also be open to challenging some of your deepest held presumptions about what's good and bad, possible and even probable in the first place. Um, if you requested or would like closed captioning, you can click on the live button that should be on the top of your screen and open up a transcription in a new tab. Um, and it's important to note that we are recording these sessions and it's likely that we will post them publicly on the Design Labs website in the future. Um, now I'm gonna just briefly introduce today's session lead, Benjamin Bratton. Um, Benjamin Bratton is a philosopher, sociologist and design theorist who researches the cultural implications of co computation and globalization, particularly through architecture, urbanism, and technology. He is currently a professor of visual arts here at the University of California, San Diego, where he directs the Center for Design and Geopolitics. He also serves as program director of the Strelka Institute in Moscow, an esteemed international five-month postgraduate program, currently working under the three-year research theme, The Terraforming, and it's a research program investigating the conditions that will ensure that the planet Earth continues to viably host Earth-like life. Benjamin is the author of The Stack on Software and Sovereignty, The Terraforming, and a forthcoming book on today's topic, The Revenge of the Real, with Verso Press. And with that, I turn it over to Ben. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and thanks, everyone. For, thank you, Stephanie, for the kind introduction. Thanks, everyone, for the... Um, for joining us today for this discussion. Um, I, I, as, as Stephanie mentioned, I want to, you know, and I believe that really the theme of this whole series is thinking about different, different ways in which um, design and, and, and really design research and that we are in a, a research university, the design research can contribute to uh, our understanding of this uh, predicament of the pandemic. Uh, and, and in principle, through that understanding, um, seek to intervene in, in particular ways, or, or perhaps it would be the other way around that through the intervention we would come to understand. But I, I, either way, um, what I hope to present to you today is a bit of some of our, our work on, the, on that particular topic, uh, which as Stephanie mentioned, is, 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 is some of which is a, is a bit of a sort of a summary gloss of uh, material that's going into a book uh, for Verso that'll be out early next year uh, on, on this topic. 
uh, and I will sort of begin with that. Um, I also wanted to take the opportunity, uh, well, also respond to the invitation uh, and request to offer a few words about um, our thoughts about speculative design, what speculative design is, uh, perhaps what it's not, um, but hopefully more positive statements rather than the negative theology uh, method. Um, and then, then we get to what I hope is actually the, the kind of the most important and interesting part of the, of the event, which would be um, a kind of scenario planning exercise in which some of the concepts from the first part, which will be a bit more theoretical, a bit more, uh, uh, would be put to work uh, collectively, collaboratively with those who, what, those who've joined us today and that we can have, um, that we can have a discussion uh, a, a discussion around uh, around these around these topics um, uh, based on this as well, and Stephanie will give you some guidance about how that will how that will all w work out. Um, so uh, Stephanie had mentioned um, this, this book, the the terraforming, um, and which also the title of this uh, think tank. Uh, it's more of a at this point more of a think tank than a the postgraduate anything, um, which I direct in. Um, uh, as at the Strelk, it have been directing at the Strelk Institute in Moscow since uh, 20, 2016. The terraforming is this. We're now beginning the second year of this particular of, of this particular focus. Um, I will. This is the book, small book that we wrote about this. I'll give you the URL. You're all welcome to download a free copy of this if, if any of this topic is of interest to you as well. But um, part of the reason I'll, I'll begin with this is, is that some of the work around the pandemic had sort of come out of some this this research initiative. Um, so the research initiative, which we, we have brought, you know brought together faculty and researchers from really all over the world, um, to to in, you know including UCSD uh, to, uh, to, to to participate, um, discussed this way: the terraforming that's at stake for this is, is not Elon Musk terraforming of Mars or something in order to make um, Mars or the Earth or the Moon or something viable for Earth-like life, but rather the an understanding that. Um, uh, whether we like it or not, that the, the sort of meta design project, if you like, in front of us is to uh, recompose the uh, the Earth, the Anthropocene we have, I suppose, um, so that Earth would remain viable for Earth-like life. And 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 uh, part of the ways in which we approach this have to do with a uh, perhaps counterintuitive emphasis on ish, on artificiality, astronomy and automation, all, all of which I try to explain in, in more detail in the book, which I invite you to download and, and, and have a look at, um, and towards, uh, towards the goal of what we call a more viable form of planetarity, a, a term which actually comes from originally from Yashi Spivak, but which we use in a rather different way to include also forms of astronomical uh, planetarity as well. Um, the Institute is a quite interesting place. I'll, I'll sort of just give you a sort of quick interest of this as well. It's a completely independent, um, in, independent institute uh, right in the center of Moscow um, that is a kind of one of the really the only remaining uh, vibrant and viable independent cultural scenes in the uh, in the city for reasons that should be clear um, and is, is now in its uh, 11th year uh, of operation. The, the think tank that I have been directing as well is one in which we, we bring together researchers um, uh, generally 25 to 35 is sort of the age range um, from a number of different disciplinary backgrounds. So about half of them have some architecture or urbanism background. The other half are uh, industrial designers, motion designers, filmmakers, philosophers, uh, economists, political scientists. And then we break them into smaller research teams, which then develop uh, uh, sort of, uh, more uh, elaborate, uh, el elaborate proposals and research uh, from that as well. We're actually... Um, in the process of uh, the admissions phase. So if there's anyone who's watching this who'd like to look at, you're also, of course, welcome to, welcome to consider joining us uh, there as well as UCSD. Um, now, part of it, the, some of the work that we did at, at this time is that, uh, like everything else, our, our work was quite interrupted by the pandemic. Um, this essay, short essay that I asked Stephanie to send out to everyone, 18 Lessons of Quarantine Urbanism, um, which I wrote, which forms a little bit of a basis of the book and the talk. Um, was also done in 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 this in, in this particular context uh, as well. We did um, after after all of our our researchers were scattered back to their countries of passport. 
uh, we we continued and did a lot of work, particularly around the, the around the issues of the pandemic. And in a nutshell, the crisis of planetary governance that the that the pandemic uh, clearly indicated, uh, and the ways in which uh, we might want to think of the situation less as a kind of state of exception or a state of emergency, rather than as a disclosure or revelation of multiple pre-existing conditions that we would need to account for. We did a series of symposia on this with uh, Daniel Vanderveld and Jeff Mayna, Holly Jane Buckshaw, Luke Nolsi, among, amongst others. We commissioned uh, 18 new essays and works, particularly on this topic, um, which I think represents, a, a, I think, a quite interesting body of, of, of more theoretical, philosophical, political, cultural responses to the pandemic. All of this is available uh, at the single URL, terraforming.stroka.com. So if you download the book, see the work, any of the stuff, please go there and take a, take, take a look at it. Now, um, the, one of the, I was asked to talk a little bit also about the methods, since this is a, 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 a series on methods, and to talk a bit about the kinds of methods that we use there, and also the methods that in here in the speculative design program at, at UCSD, which is mostly, it's an undergraduate program, and so there's a different, um, there's a different set of expectations for this, for this kind of work. But a lot of what we do is actually methodologically, I think, rather um, straightforward, is, is not so fancy. Um, basic two square structures is a lot of how we start, start with this. This, this is from a project we did around the Kardashev scales, um, Kardashev scales of, scales of civilization. Um, and the two square method, which I think most of you are familiar with, but I'll go through a bit more in detail uh, for a particular take on this a bit later, is a way in which we try to take, um, we, we, you know, where, where original research is translated into variables, which we will then matrix against each other as a way to, in a way to kind of provoke and, and um, provoke ways of approaching and thinking through problems that we would not have ourselves been able to um, kind of arrive at. Um, and just to sort of give away the beginning, sorry, the, um, that we are gonna do, the, the exercise that we'll do together later on will also be a four square exercise around a series of variables, which I'll, I will first explain to you what we mean by this, um, of the sensing layer and the subjective, subjective ethics versus ethics of the object in relationship to the pandemic. And while these may seem sort of obscure terms at the moment, I, by the end of this presentation, they should um, have uh, sparked, um, sparked some thoughts on your behalf. And in doing so, wanted to uh, flag this in advance. So let me get right to it and then talk a bit about some, uh, some of the, the, the work I've been doing around the pandemic. Some of it has been motivated by a exasperation uh, with the way in which philosophy, cultural theory uh, responded to the, to the pandemic and the ways in which if we wanted to say the pandemic represented a kind of disclosure of pre-existing conditions, the way in which it also represented an extraordinarily um, uh, mis extraordinary misalignment between conventions of cultural theory and the circumstances that it would theoretically be asked to describe. Now, some of the, some of the key ideas that we've been working through and, and developing, some of which appear in this essay that I wanted to share with you for, for the discussion um, would be some of the following. One is this idea of an epidemiological view of society and the way in which in, the, in a, in a post-pandemic circumstance that, that what we will, in essence, forever be understanding the social and the epidemiological as coterminous and overlapping and interrelated things. So instead of seeing the view, a model of society in the classical sense of, kind of individual versus society, it's now one in which there's a kind of enmeshed whole through which all of us live our lives. And the biological organism of us all it, it, it understood as a transmission medium of ideas, transmission of viruses, um, is one in which we are all connected and disconnected from in various different kinds, in various different kinds of ways. And, and as should be clear, with COVID-19, the, 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 the problem of contagion itself is dangerous is, is not, the risk, and this is really one of the key points we'll come back to, the risk is not just individual. It is a collective risk. Um, it is a risk that is held in a plurality rather than one that can be identified and managed through individual subjectivity or individual biology. And this shift is essential. Is 
So the epidemiological view should also allow for a kind of sense of subjectivity. And here's the key point, away from private individuation and towards public transmissibility. And this desubjectivization of the ethical in relationship to the epidemiological is part of exactly what we are, are interested in. This shifts the emphasis away from personal experience towards responsibilities that are couched in an underlying biological and chemical reality that binds us together, that precedes us, and is ultimately indifferent, indifferent to the kinds of uh, 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 moral projections that we might, we might bring upon it. Um, one of the other ideas, particularly around the crisis of governance that we have been, that we're working with, what we call the great filtering, which was this, this moment in which uh, a kind of scramble um, a few months ago in which the naturally mobile hum homo sapiens species, which has always been meandering across the surface of its home planet for, um, for, for so many uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, um, was asked to instantaneously filter itself, sort itself, and go back to its country of passport origin, um, which in an instant revealed both the, um, the artificiality of, of, that, of the kind of national citizenship as a way of organizing human populations, the fragility of that model, but also the fact that we didn't really have any other uh, options at hand. It seemed as though this was just the best, the best that could be done given other circumstances, even though in such obvious ways, the socio-epidemiological -epide circumstance was one that was um, by definition ignorant of those kinds of divisions. Um, that filtering also uh, in ways that were more, uh, more gruesome also then resulted in a, in a very strong differenti differential between who would live and die, who would be sick and not sick, depending upon which jurisdiction you happen to be uh, refiltered, resorted uh, back, back into at a particular time, which leads us to the next point. And that is that you know, one of the things that, that you know, political scientists, political theorists would, would, would look back at this time would, would, in amazement is that we are living through what is largely the largest experiment in comparative governance that any of us are likely to see in our lifetimes. The, with the virus itself as, as kind of the control variable. How it is that different systems, different states responded um, and how different political cultures continue to respond and evaluate the, 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 these kinds of things um, are ones in which various traditions and take it for granted logics of what constitutes appropriate relationships of individual society and politics and so forth are clearly on display. On display. Brazil is failing. Singapore is succeeding, Iran was failing, Hong Kong is succeeding, so forth and so on. Some aspects of central command and control seem to have worked, others have not. Some strengths of the Western liberal, liberal model have worked, while others, while others clearly have not. Um, others have left us in a bit of a daze. Anyway, all of the systems are facing the same test at the same time, and I think the results are plain to see, um, and not so difficult to, not so difficult to count. Um, the countries that do have done the worst in terms of deaths per 100,000 of, of populations um, are ones that have, we might identify certain particular patterns of, of, of governance, certain particular uh, problems of the institutionality of public health, ones that have been beset by the earlier uh, contagion of, of, of populist politics in the past and so forth and so on. It's quite clear what works and what doesn't work. Um, one of the things that we've, one of the resources that we've been using as a way of sort of trying to quantify some of this, just as a sort of tip for some of the researchers, Oxford's um, government response tracker is quite good um, at uh, giving uh, a lot of comparative data around different kinds of responses, not only at the national level, but all the way down to the urban level, um, urban level again. And so, again, the patterns that we see are, are um, are quite clear. Um, this is uh, this a few days out of date, um, but the country the proximity to China uh, was not the issue, as we're all, all, all aware of. Taiwan, Singapore, uh, Vietnam uh, did, did extremely well. Um, U.S., Brazil, and Russia did, did extremely poorly um, in the kind of response here as well. Um, and so the question of why. <laughs> 
Why is that? It doesn't have to do with GDP uh, necessarily. It has to do with other kinds of, it has to do with obvious other kinds of factors. And so the question of, you know, to what extent, okay, does Taiwan win uh, this the, the, the race actually, uh, you know, what is to be, uh, what's to be kind of drawn from that? And, and what did it do well? Well, some of the things that we know that it did well, um, what had to do with the fact data was made public. Uh, it was made public early. It was made public in a way that was consistent. Um, it was made, it was, uh, it, it, that there wasn't, that was roughly depoliticized as much as possible. Um, that, uh, that early on, uh, the ability to identify and track cases uh, was, was, pro, was proactive and was relatively, uh, relatively uh, efficient. There was, enorm there was a, 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 extremely importantly, a high degree of, of, of social trust in, uh, in these mechanisms um, in, 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 in as well. And this is also something that we have to look at. Now, this doesn't mean that everything that was done was uh, good or everything that was done was even useful. There was also a lot done, including spraying streets in the rain with this, that was more of a kind of theater of security more than it was uh, anything else, which is also part of this, uh, also part of this kind of dynamic. Um, it's also not simply to say that the, all of the Asian responses were, uh, were, 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 uh, were successful and the Western responses were not. There's much that will be coming out, I'm sure, over the next months and years about um, the, the uh, calamities of, uh, uh, of China's nevertheless eventually successful response of this as well. One of the things we can see, though, <clears throat> is that one of my new favorite phrases, that historically ungovernable cultures uh, didn't do particularly well. And that this question of governability and governance per se, uh, and the crisis, part of the crisis in which I think we found ourselves was one in which it wasn't only that there was, um, uh, that it wasn't only that there was an absence of governance uh, able to actually come into the, and actually able to act at a particular point in time or to coordinate responses at a particular time. There was also a political culture that was not, amenable to governance responses to these in general. Um, and so whether that's Texas or Brazil uh, or, or, it, or, or Italy, the quote, historically ungovernable cultures are one in which there is a cultural dynamic that needs to be accounted for. It's one that we see here in the United States, um, particularly in terms of populist right kinds of responses to the to this circumstances, but it's also one in which the populist left um, is probably as has as much to do with this with the issues as uh, um, as well in different in different kinds of ways. Now, let me move on. Um, one of the questions then we are, we also became interested in then in terms of this question of governance was the role of simulations and models. Not only the role of simulations and models for official government bureaucrats and public health officials in order to make sense of what's going on. Uh, in a way that was reliable, though that is obviously extraordinary impor extraordinarily important, but also the role of model simulations in how publics saw and understood this circumstance, which, which goes a lot to, I think, this epidemiological model of society, that it became a point in which one saw one, you know, think of it in terms of the difference between egocentric and allocentric mapping. We each, in a certain way, came to see ourselves as a data as data points within a larger epidemiological model, and we're able to govern it. We're able to decide and understand our own relationship and relative risk um, in 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 those in ways that were um, in, in ways that would have seemed very unlikely a, a year ago that people would take such interest in these things. Um, now, we, a lot of our other work has had to do with the importance of models within governing systems itself. We are you know, we, I recognize that what we call planetary scale computation uh, is, is in a way really the, the sort of the underlying infrastructure by which any of this works comes to take on the roles of governance in many ways. We recognize that the very idea of climate change, the concept of climate change is itself an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation. Without the sensing modeling, uh, the sensing modeling and computational mechanisms to produce the statistical uh, regularities that we rec recognize as climate change, that this concept of planetarity that is the governing challenge going forward would not have, would not be before us in the way that it is. So I've been looking back at some of these as well. You know, I also do a, a fair bit of work in, in Shanghai uh, 
um, on on issues around Chinese AI and and was following a lot of the the early outbreaks there using a lot of the Chinese. This I took some screenshots just for my own sort of thing. This is really early on in the in the pandemic. You see here as well um, from early February, where at that point there was about twenty thousand total cases. Um, about 650 people had died at that point in time, and everyone was panicking. Um, if we were to, of course, to get things back to that situation, it would be considered a, a tremendous success. But there's also this effect that, you know, many of you who, who probably have, who are from China or friends or colleagues from China, have a sense of a bit of a Cassandra, a, a, a feeling of a bit kind of, kind of Cassandra complex of it, where, where you saw what was happening there and how it was unfolding and could see what you under, knew what was going to happen in the U.S. and Europe uh, immediately, and, and and a way you sort of felt as though you were living a few weeks in the future, uh, but couldn't do anything about it. Um, now, just this is well. Stephanie happened to send me this this morning, which I, I was moving around with. I think it's quite interesting. This this is also from Oxford. Um, their epidemic epidemic forecast calculator, where uh, you're able to enter into different kinds of variables into figure out how it is that the different kinds of social responses to government measures would have uh, different kinds of effects in the reduction of R uh, around this as well. So another thing that we've been looking at a lot and have a lot of interest in, as I mentioned, some of the work around China and AI has to do with uh, the role of artificial intelligence within, within this now sociological, epidemiological model of the of, of, of the social. There was a fair bit, uh, some of you are probably familiar with, with uh, early outbreak trackers um, and the rest of the, and, and, and so forth around this as well. Um, you know, there's a, there is a, um, a, a, a special AI phenomenon, I think is yes, yet has a name, but it's one that we should come up with a name for because it really defines a lot what happened here. If we use AI in order to find patterns in large amounts of information that we we could not cognitively intuit on our own. That's the point of it. We would never. We would necessarily come up with patterns that seem totally counterintuitive. Uh, and and yet, at that moment of deciding that there's something we define a counterintuitive pattern, and then deciding we have to actually believe that pattern, there is in a way a kind of like yes, but that can't be true moment. Um, that's what happened here. There was a lot of these, a lot of the outbreak, a lot of this stuff actually did do a relatively good job in terms of identifying outbreaks, but was understood as a bit of a kind of like, no, that blinking red light can't possibly mean what, it said, what, what it's supposed to mean. Okay, now, one of the key ideas I wanted to share with you and to have us think around is this idea of the sensing layer, which is if we think about a governing system and, and you know, going back to Max Weber, the idea of a state as, as an information sensing and organizing uh, institution is, is foundational. There's nothing new about that. But all of the ways in which a state is able to sense what's going on, or really put this way, the way in which a, a society, a social body, is able to sense and understand what's going on with itself, using the instruments of governance in order to do that. All of those sensory self-sensing capacities we might call the sensing layer. Of, of this governance. And so by this, we don't just mean the kinds of stuff you see in smart city infomercials with exotic sensors. Um, we also mean the kinds of, you know, the kinds of things that a, a properly social democratic healthcare system would provide as therapeutic mechanisms of taking people's temperature and, and taking people's samples and providing adequate and pervasive and accessible testing so that this social body would be able to actually model itself properly so that it would actually be able to act back upon itself in a way that is equitable and effective. And so the sensing layer refers to both these rather high tech kinds of things and also to these ways that are very high touch uh, and direct care kinds of ways. And part of the problem we've seen here in the US, for example, is, is all the different ways in which our sensing layer is broken. Um, some of the ways it's broken because of it, it, it and one of the most uh, severe ways in which it's broken has to do with access, has to do with there is the, the populations of people who are in essence undersensed, who are not, who, who, who for reason, for any number of different reasons, are in, a, are in a way unaccounted for, are unidentified and unsensed in terms of the ways in which that social structure is able to model uh, in order to model itself. Um, there's different ways and different contexts in which 
uh, that has worked out, some of which are, are, are things that there is no technical, there's no technological barrier to this. The barriers are cultural and sociological, the barriers are cultural and sociological. If someone were to show up at the door of the sub, if someone to show up like this at the subway in New York City and take the temperature of everyone getting off of this, like, there would be a knot of people who just would refuse to be sensed, who would refuse to participate in this social model. The, re the, the cultural logic of the relationship between individual society is quite different and qu quite different in the United States than it is in other parts of the world. And it is to a certain extent, both to our benefit and our detriment. And I, in terms of the pandemic, it's been increasingly to our, to our detriment. And so we've had to scramble and do other kinds of adaptive measures, including, you know, in, in, that we're all sort of familiar with to try to make up for the fact that's something that the largest, that the country with the largest economy in the history of the world was unable to provide the most basic care also, to its, to its even, citizens. It also, of the, of the other things we want to, uh, uh, it's also to sort of better make count for is the ways in which that the, the, the more extreme examples of the cultural responses um, to, the, to the pandemic, uh, which we're all, you know, more or less, f more or, or, or less familiar with, which involve a, a different kind of cultural relationship to governance that it not just borders on forms of, uh, of paranoia, but which is deeply paranoid in and of itself. And the, 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 what I want to caution is not just that there, that the, what I want to caution is that this is not just a uh, an outlier phenomenon. I think that it is, it is symptomatic of a more fundamental, a, 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 sadly, a more fundamental relationship between logics and, cult and cultures of governance and relationships to, uh, to, relationship to sociality uh, that is more pervasive and across the political spectrum. So let me end that section with there's a quote from uh, Akshil Mbembe who writes, uh, about a different topic, but I think very, very appropriate here. The, uh, actually, Mbembe is the, the, uh, uh, the, the based in South Africa, professor of, of literary theory and political philosophy based in, in, in South Africa. He writes, striking in this regard is the apparent shift from a politics of reason to a politics of experience, if not of viscerality. In the eyes of the many, personal experience has become a new way of being at home in the world. It's like the bubble that holds the foam at a distance. Experience nowadays trumps reason. We are led to believe that sensibility, emotions, affect, sentiments, and feelings are the real stuff of subjecthood and therefore of radical agency. See, of subjecthood and therefore of radical agency. Paradoxically, in the paranoid tenor of our epic, this is very much in tune with the dominant strictures of neoliberal individualism. It is also in line with the ongoing reconfigurations of the relation between technology, reason, and other human faculties. I entirely agree with his point here as well, which raises some of the issues in which that we're at least also at the level of urban design that we're trying to deal with in terms of what, what we, the circumstance in which we find ourselves of apparent touchlessness. What does it mean for society in which those direct uh, epidermal intimacies are, are uh, and, and, and the proxemics around which we've all learned to grow are no longer, no longer um, available to us. It means that sensing has to happen to a certain extent and that organization at a distance. Now, I want to say then a couple words then on, on, uh, because some of the questions that were raised by this thing around the ethics of bio uh, medicine and surveillance um, as the topic for this series, I wanted to say a few words for. Um, lest my, lest my, my comments be misconstrued, I'm not arguing on behalf of surveillance. I'm arguing that the term surveillance needs to be um, Needs to, that we need additional words to describe the kinds of things that we're talking about, and that reducing all of these phenomena to this term surveillance is actually uh, getting is actually preventing uh, what we want to have happen. Um, it, that is, we need to define and interpret and deploy uh, in, in this idea in different ways. And as I mentioned, you know, really go right at the beginning of this pandemic, there was another a colleague of mine who will remain unnamed. Um, uh, who argued to me, he's based in, in Germany, so it's probably not, no one we know, argued to me that, pe that his, that, that, um, that to, uh, argued and told his students that they should resist getting tested for the virus. They should not allow themselves to be tested for the virus because acquiescing to this 
is, would only encourage, in his words, big data biopolitics. Um, and, he, and, and for him, he was explicitly that this was the bigger, the bigger threat and, and, and encouraged them to refuse to participate in this around this well. I, I think at the beginning of that of the pandemic, he may have been a bigger audience for that, but I, I, I hope now that this is that the terms of this have shifted a little bit. Though, if we think back to the last week to this demonstration that just happened in Berlin, uh, I don't know if he was there. Um, perhaps this, this this idea is 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 accruing. Now, one of the key ideas around the, the question around surveillance and social structure surveillance and, and, and social and surveillance as a mode of sensing or sensing a mode of surveillance within this has to do with phone tracking apps for the most part they've been unsuccessful they haven't really been deployed it's a particularly large scale Singapore even Singapore with its app had a lot of trouble getting to sign up for this as well so to a certain extent it's a bit of a red herring China obviously did a much more with that because there's a much more integration with WeChat and Alibaba and the rest of this as well um, and on this as well. But the key problem, of, of, uh, as we know, of doing phone tracking within the United States, even a relatively anonymous tracker like the one that Google and Apple provided, um, has to do with the fact there's just too many people, that the tracking can only really work if the population, if, if the conditions of contagion that you're trying to model are manageable. And we just don't have we don't have the, the human infrastructure in order to manage the exponential complexities of those interactions in, the, in, in, in this way. And so the question of tracking apps took a lot of the folk and whether or not they were good or bad took a lot of the focus away f as, as, a, as a social problem within the sensing layer when a lot of the focus should have been on much more fundamental things like making sure testing was broadly available. So the, in other words, here's the thing. The ethical question was focused on how do we properly prevent pernicious surveillance rather than on how do we ensure and enable positive sensing that would actually allow, uh, that, that, would actually, uh, 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 that would actually be inclusive and allow for proper models. So real quickly, I think as we know, you know, this question around surveillance has become you know, it started as something that was a bit more of a, you know, this is Victor Taus, you know, drawings from Vic, one of Victor Taus's patients of the return of the century, uh, 1800s, the influencing machine. This idea that new technology is somehow controlling our thoughts um, is something that is in increasingly uh, part of the populist politics in one way, uh, in, in one way or another. It's, it is affecting our, not only the ability to deal with the pandemic, but in deal, ability to deal and govern ourselves and for society to be able to properly model itself in general. Um, there are some ways in which it becomes kind of laughably or sadly psychiatric in its connotations and other ways in which it is fundamental to the way in which even uh, our, our, our mainstream cultural theory um, is developed. And that way it is that the, 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 the the inordinate focus on all that the that the inordinate emphasis on the suppression and resistance to all forms of social sensing as being by definition a form of pernicious pernicious control i.e surveillance is one of the ways in which the culture of the the, uh, the culture of the moment has made proper governance of itself impossible in the way in which we find ourselves here today <clears throat> and it, again, it is not just the right, it's also the left. Here's somebody's yoga instructor at that rally in Berlin, and the rest of this as well. It is across the spectrum and is part of the problem. Now, this is contrasted oftentimes, as we found in comparative, like versus China. Well, China did this or that, but China is often also in ways that are beyond, uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, beyond, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, empirical reality held up as as an example of forms of everyday totalitarianism that are. Um, uh, it, it is not that the autocratic governance in, in the authoritarian autocratic governance in China doesn't exist, but it, it operates in ways that are quite different than it is mythologized to operate at. Um, there's also, I think, a real problem in that in the in the same way is that which that the. In, in the sort of, let's put it this way: the, in the that the fear of technology itself has been and is increasingly expressed as a fear of China. That fear of technology becomes fear of China. And that in, in this, all forms of sort of old, uh, kind of the, the quote, the nature of the Oriental is itself despotic, kind of old forms of Orientalist thinking about, about uh, Asian despotism, it, it, are coming back from even the, the panic, you know, establishment voices in ways that are, 
quite disturbing. So again, like if the if 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 the if the flip side the flip side I guess of the sino the kind of sino futurist fantasies that China is the super high tech society, it, the flip side of that is that the not that the enthusiasm particularly, but the fear of technology becomes a fear of Asia and fear of China in particular. That you know the hardcore version of this is that instead of the yellow horde that we need to be concerned, it's this wave of, of emotionless robots that are going to take us over. And so that this, the way in what, another way in which we need to think about the comparative governance dynamic here as well, is the ways in which one political culture imagines itself in relationship to another political culture about which it tells itself stories. It's also important, I think, to think about how it is the particular examples of, of what we might think of as surveillance change over time. I did an experiment last year with some of my freshman students where I, I basically explained to them like, you know, here's a bunch of scenarios. Could you please tell me whether or not you think this would be an inappropriate, an inappropriate form of social surveillance were this to happen? And one of the examples that I gave was imagine, imagine the phone company, Verizon or whatever, printed out all of its customers' names and addresses and phone numbers and not only leaked this on the internet, it actually printed out a copy of this and delivered it to every one of their customers by door so that everyone could see what each other's phone numbers around as well. Would you consider this an invasion of privacy? 75, 76 actually percent of the undergraduates in the class thought that this would be a, a, a pernicious invasion of privacy. Most of whom, you know, some of whom, some of whom did already know that this is the white pages and that we've been doing this for some time. All of us should say is the connotation shift as well. There's other ways, of course, in which the politics of big data can work itself out. The whole politics of the archive is another kind of politics of big data that we need to be, I think, training our attention as an ethical response uh, more on, a kind of positive connotation of this. An archive, the, which of course go back thousands of years, archives are a, big, are, are, are a form of ethical big data. The, at, at, per Derrida, the archive is the way in which the present makes a promise to the future. We, we don't know how it is the future will want to account for us, or how, the, how the future will judge us, but if we don't give it the information to judge us properly, to actually account for ourselves to the future, we are in essence, uh, uh, um, uh, that, that there's a sort of a, 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 an ethical obligation that, that we have missed. Um, and so it's this ethics of, uh, the ethics of data, not the ethics from data that I want to emphasize here. Now, really quickly, um, some of the other issues we've been working on have to do with resiliency and automation. One of the things that we saw was also the, the ways in which um, uh, the ways in which automated system delivery systems have sort of taken over and, and provided a kind of emergency public sphere that didn't that wasn't there as well. Of course, they've done so in ways that are at a tremendous degree of 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 of, um, uh, of, of, of social disparity. Um, the sort of work um, and, 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 and in ways in which the politics of automation will be trained on exactly that disparity going forward. Um, and that, that disparity in terms of who or what is considered an essential worker, the ways in which that they're treated um, and are, in essence are, are, are not, in, not included in that capacity of self-governance is exactly kind of the issue. Um, some of the other things we've been looking at are having to do with this idea of strategic essentialism and what constitutes essential businesses, not essential businesses. In California, essential businesses and essential work, essential work was divided up by industry sector, not by type of work. In other words, if you were, I don't know, a secretary for a construction company that you could go to work, if you were a secretary for some other individual, in other words, the industry sector became this as well. And we think that this will be shifting a lot. Now, let me say a little bit about masks, because this goes quite to the populism thing. Um, masks are, of course, one of humanity's most ancient and accomplished art forms. Um, the two kinds of masks that we've tend to be making are either expressive or functional masks. Expressive maps are ones that allow us to change the presentation of, of, of meaningful social identity. Functional masks, things like gas masks, are ones that are produce an artificial atmosphere um, that, and have a prophylactic capacity. And obviously some masks are doing both. They're both expressive and functional. Um, at certainly the ways in which the mask wars uh, have been uh, organized here in the United States. Um, the expressivity of mask or not mask um, is one that has taken on an extraordinarily grim um, 
uh, kind of sorts of sorts of connotations, where the functionality of the mask is itself uh, a, a dynamic around which certain forms of self-expression, of of camaraderie, of a, a sense of ethical participation in the immunological commons, are played out or refused uh, in one way, uh, in one way or another. And in, in of course, within this, the ways in which the face itself becomes technologized in different kinds of ways. These are some of the masks you can have printed of your own face that'll let you unlock your iPhone uh, without it as well. Um, there's something to say about the Guy Fawkes mask and the, and the religion of populism, but I'll, I'll prep around this as well. Last point on this is what, the issue about touchlessness and the mask and the social distances we found ourselves around with this as well. These are serious sociological and anthropological circumstances in which we find ourselves. Just think about the handshake, where right? the handshake has long been this a kind of intimate ritual of trust, of intimacy. The bond of the handshake once meant personal trust through touch. But now, if a stranger were to walk up to you and offer you their exposed hand, you would find them conversely deeply untrustworthy um, in, in this kind of in this kind of in, in this kind of regard. Um, one of the things I think you know, one of our, our researchers were looking at. The, the, the history of the culture, the, the, the mobilization of cultures around prophylactics within the AIDS crisis, a different kind of, it, a quite different type of issue around pandemic and touchlessness, but the ways in which uh, prophylactics were positioned and mobilized as something that would allow for the freedom of intimacy um, that was recognizable that in which the, 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 vulnerab the co-vulnerability between two people could be acknowledged uh, and accounted for in, in, in a way that was positive, such that the mutual vulnerability and the mutual intimacy of the encounter uh, were related to one another in a way that was quite positive. And I think some of those kinds of politics of, of touch and touchlessness are the ones in front of us. Now, um, to, to wrap this sort of section up as well, part of the issue here, and we'll see that it has to do, as, as I think has been made clear, is that when we're talking about bioethics here, within the Western and American context, this tends to be structured in such a way of there is a free individual, and this free, and we need to make sure that, this, that the terms of this, that the, that the sovereignty of this encapsulated free individual is not, um, it, it is not, uh, uh, that, that, that is not molested or some violence is done to the, 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 this, the sovereignty of this individual, that the, pro, that the privacy, that the subject's interior subjectivity of this person, their volition, and their own privacy, um, separate from the rest of the, is, is in essence sacrosanct, and that the question of ethics has to do with how do we make sure that collective action, medical action, technical intervention within them does not uh, does not violate the terms of that, does not violate the terms of that privacy. Now, that is, I'm, I'm not at all suggesting that it is not important. I'm not suggesting that this is an irrelevant issue. I'm suggesting that when that becomes the only way in which the relationship between the epidemiological commons and individual persons is understood and negotiated through an ethical vision vocabulary, it will lead to the situation in which we find ourselves every time. The converse of this, might to this highly subjective form of ethics might be something we might think of sort of the ethics of being an object. One of the things that, you know, those of us who wear masks and go out into the world and do so for the benefits of ourselves and the benefit of strangers that we come in contact with is an understanding that whether or you want to or not, you are a potential contagion vector, that your own, that your biochemical your bio, you as a biochemical assemblage, and this is the key point, regardless of your moral intentionality, regardless of your moral intentionality, you, your condition as a risk to someone else and the risk to the whole is the same. The conception of, in essence, an ethics that is based on the idea of you being an object with certain biochemical properties is quite different than the idea of a subjective ethics, which is based on the intentional subjective, volitional, moral attitude that one has towards other people, that I wish to do you harm or I wish not to do you harm, and how it is that I can negotiate this, this intentionality. The, 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 the ethics of an objectivity is one in which we want, we are, we're certain more interested. Now, 
there's a whole other thing to say about the, the, the social explosions that happened in relation, that were triggered by the George Floyd protests and the rest of this out as well, which I'm going to sort of leave, leave here for a, sort of, for a second, other than just to say that it goes part and parcel with this crisis of governance and governmentality in which we find ourselves. In essence, be, for various reasons, both from neoliberal economics and from a, a sort of long-standing left distrust of, of, of governance and so forth, after a decades-long dismantling of governance, piece by piece, we have nothing left but of governance other than police functions. That's, that takes up most of the budget. Governance is now those police functions. And so that's where the structure of society as a whole would be contested. And worse, and even worse, that's where it's attempting to reconstruct ourselves. In the long run, the question of what kind of society we want cannot be reduced to the kind of question of what kind of policing we want, and yet here we are. Um, but that's what happens when, when the dismantling of governance as a whole uh, is successful. We get the pandemic, and we get this response to the pandemic. So to be clear, part of the question I want us to think about in our exercise here is in what ways is an overemphasis on the sanctity of individuality the problem for, bio, for medical ethics rather than the solution for medical ethics? In what way, in other words, is do we need to be focusing on the kind of ethics of unaccountability to, to sort of you know, coin this sort of phrase, which means at least two things. One is this ethic of the object the ethics of how do we think about the, 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 an ethical relationship to the immunological and epidemiological commons of ourselves as a, uh, as a species in common that is not predicated on moral intentionality, but is predicated on the objective biochemistry of contagion, uh, that is predicated on the collective risk rather than the individual psychological, uh, uh, individual psychological insult, and second, how do we think about, with this idea that th thinking about the, like the inadequacy of how testing was available to people in different, in different socioeconomic relationships, to think about the problem of undersensing, who is unsensed, who is not brought into the sensing layer, who is unmodeled, whose lives are considered not worthy of being measured and being accounted for, not just by the state, but by how society models and acts back upon itself through the state. This is the question for governmentality that I want us to ask. So <clears throat> the four square that we're going to be looking at around this as well, will sort of work in this way. The, the, two, the critical variables that we're gonna be interested in will be the sensing layer plus sensing layer minus. What I mean is, imagine a world in which there's a strong, robust, accessible governing sensing layer that is able to produce an adequate model of that societal system versus one in which there is not in which there is one that is distorted or inadequate and is not able to, the society is not able to sense itself at all. Next, imagine uh, circumstances or the conditions or policies or provocations or scenarios in which that circumstance is dealt with primarily through the subjective ethics. That is, that, is, that the terms of medical ethics, of biomed public health ethics is decided primarily in terms of how it is that the private subjective individual can be, that their, they can be protected from the incursions of the collective versus the ethics of the object in which the, that sort of indifferent biological reality of each of us as, a, as an animalian reality of each of us is taken as the basis of our of our uh, ethical relationship to one another, in, in, regardless of our subjective intentionality. So there are in way, four different possibilities, robust sensing layer, ethics of the object, sense, poor sensing layer, ethics of the subject, and so forth and so on. So what we're gonna ask you to think about is what do any of those or what do those look like? And again, it's not just like, what is the solution to this? But what does, what does the world look like when these two variables are, are thought in relationship to one another? And how are they defined by that relationship? So very quickly, I was asked, I'm going to try to go faster here. What quickly I was asked also to say a few words about speculative design um, and where I sort of thought within this as well. Um, there's, this would be an entire talk in and of itself, obviously, but I'll try to just give you the gist of it. Um, my friend Elliot Montgomery put together this, this helpful uh, chart, which sort of tries to locate a little bit the relationship between these different forms of design. 
Um, and it's one that I find quite interesting, both because in the ways in which I agree with it and disagree with it, or the ways in which, let's say, I find it accurate but depressing, uh, and, and, and therefore worthy of a little bit more discussion here as well. And so by way of, of my point, let me just make a few comments here as well. One is this dynamic of the constrained and the unconstrained. The idea that strategy, you know, the hard-nosed problem of how do you make usable doorknobs and disposable razors for businesses is considered defined by constraint, whereas art and science fiction is understood by the lack of constraint. Um, I honestly think that at least for speculative design, it's quite the opposite. For speculative design is sometimes understood as being the form of design that happens when there are no constraints in which you can just wildly think whatever you want and you know, what do we do if there's flying cars or what if you could, you know, medicines were, you know, nano pills you could eat and like, there's no limits to whatever. That's really not the way we approach it, to be honest. It may be the way others approach it, but it's not the way we approach it. We approach it, I think, through a, a kind of deep and rigorous research about what the real constraints actually are. Ecological constraints, socioeconomic constraints, ethical constraints for sure, um, material constraints, chemical constraints, historical constraints, what the actual real constraint, not the constraints of we need to get it out this fourth quarter or you know, the iPhone 17 is happening so we need to have something to compete. These are not real constraints. The real constraints are some, are, have to do with things that are uh, non-negotiable in other kinds of ways. Speculative design is the kind of design that takes those constraints so seriously that the, it, it, it offers responses to them that are so functional, so utilitarian, so practical in relationship to those constraints that they seem totally uncanny, perhaps even insane, completely unrecognizable and, 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 and otherwise, unthink otherwise unthinkable because they are in fact so functional. And in doing so, they make, and even if they are to that extent very unlikely to happen. The, 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 the corollary to that is it makes all those things that are likely to happen. It is likely that our healthcare system will go in a particular direction. It is likely that, um, that certain people will, you know, will have or not have access. It makes all those very likely things seem insane by comparison. In other words, I think constraint is actually the condition of good speculative design, not the lack of constraint. One of the things I see here, I think is an accurate description as well, is the fact that art and strategy don't touch. That, strat that art has no access to actually affecting um, strategic, strategic decisions in this regard, other than as a sort of, sort of subconscious. And strategy is totally under, uninformed by this basic fact, co human capacity for abstraction. Um, I think that's an accurate description. It's also one that's extremely depressing. Um, I'm not sure how my science fiction friends would will feel about science fiction being in, in, by, by, uh, entirely within art. That might be a more of an American context. Certainly the Russian, Polish, and Chinese versions of science fiction are much closer to, to the strategy side, but that's all right. Um, you know, the fact that you design thinking basically exists only in this amorphous thing called design and strategy, disconnected from everything else. Um, is probably is probably accurate. I, I, I should say that I'm not a fan of design thinking in capital D, capital T, in the way that in the way that in which it it, it has been it, it's been done. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't have purposes, but I think part of what it has done is in 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 line with the larger wave of deprofessionalization and pop and the and populist politics in general. It has turned design and designers, instead of being experts with some form of authority, it's turned design into a kind of, uh, of mediation of uh, mediation of all possible opinions, um, as if they were, uh, uh, and facilitation uh, in ways in which they're deeply suspect of any kinds of expertise. It dissolves the profession into something that other people are asked to do as an over as overtime in their regular. Uh, in, their, in their regular jobs. It also tends to lead not to the discovery of the realities, it tends to lead not to the discovery of, of hidden nuggets of wisdom that designers would have needed in order to do their job. It tends to lead to foregone conclusions. Um, it tends to lead to a kind of, uh, of middling, uh, middling outcome uh, that, that doesn't really satisfy anyone. Now, 
as a way of, of introducing, you start thinking about this in terms of the next phase, which is the kind of, a kind of thinking I'm asking you to do with this Foursquare example, think of it this way. Let, let me give a few sort of, uh, uh, you know, instructions, if you like it. One, in thinking about the relationship between these things, what is a subjective ethics with strong sensing layer? What is a, a objective ethics with low sensing layer, so forth and so on? I'm not asking you to come up with a solution, and I'm not asking you to come up with something that you necessarily even agree with. If in the conflation and organization of these two concepts, that they produce a world that in which something quite dark, is likely or something is implied by this, this is what needs to be articulated. And again, it's not the solution that is the point. It is what does the world look like? What does the problem space look like when we see it through the lens of these two concepts working in relationship with each other? Um, last point on this, uh, in, in my conversations with, with Scott Clemmer, uh, we, we've had a number of interesting conversations about you know, relationship between spec design and other kinds of design as well. And Scott had this great line where he said, speculative design is interesting, where, whereas engineering and traditional design is interested in, in the elimination of ambiguity, to take lots of forms of ambiguity and to, in essence, focus them into the most, you know, appropriate rational solution. Speculative design is interested in the cultivation of ambiguity, of taking something that seems like it's well understood and actually demonstrating it that it's that the commonsensical approach to it, it, it it's not that it's just um, habitual, but that it's actually um, not objective enough, that it actually requires a greater degree of ambiguity. So I'm asking you, in essence, to cultivate the ambiguity, not to give us answers, but to re ask the questions and tell us that show the ways in which some of the answers we thought we had. Uh, may not be answers to what we thought they were. Okay, so real quickly then, I'm going to sort of run through a little bit of the uh, two by two scenario planning uh, for everyone, just make sure everyone's on the same page here. Many of you have probably been doing this quite a lot. For those of you who haven't, I'm happy to sort of walk through it a bit. Um, the, the, the terminology of this and the framing of this, you know, comes from really uh, Herman Kahn after the World War II and a shift in the idea of what constitutes the future itself that arrives with the beginning of, of futures as a discipline in the mid 20th century. You know, roughly, John Williams has a piece in uh, Critical Inquiry, it's a lovely history of this as well, but one of the things we can see with the early 20th century is a shift from the idea of the future as a kind of, a, a kind of tautological foregone conclusion that at the end of the book of revelations, this is what's going to happen after the revolution, dialectical materialism will tell this is going to happen. That is the idea that you could divine a future that's already set in it set out by just enough information that you could figure out what the parameters are to get to a future that is already in essence teleologically implied. This is a sh the shift that we see in futures thinking in the early 20th century is from instead of the future as being an endpoint that we can just divine, it's an understanding of multiple futures, that there are so many smaller contingencies that if each one were to change just slightly, that the future that would ensue would be radically different than the one that we worked out. And so in order to get a handle on futures and to think through the future, you can't try to narrow it down to the future. You need to be able to account for and entertain multiple conflicting futures at once and to entertain them as if they were all equally likely. And so, you know, whether it's Shell Oil in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that pioneered a lot of this use, the Rand Corporation here in San Diego, the Jasons, um, this kind of two by two driven scenario planning um, has been one of the ways in which political science and speculative design have been in, have been in dialogue for uh, a, a, almost, almost a century. And one of the things they're quite good at is the development of this ambiguity. So there's nothing fancy about this tool. Um, you know, one of the things about methods, you know, I obviously is that, is that the methods that we, the work that we do might be very complex, but the methods we use are maybe very simple. What, 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 what's important is the actually doing the work to think through what those critical variables should be and to actually have the capacity intellectually and technically to represent what the worlds um, that are implied by the matrixing of these variables would be. So, in a nutshell, the way in which we will do this, in order to develop the four square, you need to have these, these critical variables, critical variables A, B, C, and D, or A plus, A minus, B plus, B minus, in order to matrix them against 
against one, against one another. The way in which we'll do this is after this sort of rigorous research phase, we'll generate way more critical variables than we ever actually need. That there is a, a surplus of possibilities of what we will develop in relationship with one another. We might develop a hundred of these and think through what structure, what, how they actually are and what they might be. We'll then begin to matrix them against each other. So Y plus Y minus, X plus Y minus. And the thing to keep in mind is, is oftentimes a variable that seems really exciting by itself, like that's a really interesting idea, the plus or minus of that is interesting, doesn't necessarily mean it's an interesting variable. Once you matrix it again, in other words, you get two very interesting ideas matrix against each other, they almost cancel each other out. Sometimes it's actually quite, quite mm, suspiciously mundane variables that turn out when you matrix them to tell you something you never would have thought of before. So just to give you an example of like one that I do with my undergraduate students here at UCSD quite a bit it has to do with, uh, we do a lot of work on the history of philosophy of, of AI. And so for example, we'll come up with one where example that, that a, a socioeconomics, usually I try to matrix these as a socioeconomic a variable versus a technical variable and put them against each other. You don't want two, tech, two technical variables or two socioeconomic variables. You want one technical, one socioeconomic or one technical, one cultural. So one is AI automation leads to a more unstable economic inequality. The other one, AI automation leads to more equitable and stable economies. The other one is there's open AI, the AI is the AI, the open AI models, the AI models, training sets, technologies are widely available for general use to lots of different people in lots of different ways. The other one is that you have a kind of closed platform and that large platforms predominate and that a small number of of, of well-capitalized entities have control of the situation. So you then have four possible worlds. You've got one world which um, you have an open and stable world where AI is generally available to lots of different people and this results in a more equitable and stable economics. You have a closed and unstable world where because it's controlled by highly capitalized platforms that this leads to a greater degree of, of, of social inequality and unstable economics. Those are the two you kind of expect. Those are the two that you get lots of op-eds about already. But then you get two that you never would have thought of. And those are usually the interesting ones. You get the open and unstable one where you have AI is broadly available to everyone and therefore you have this unstable and unequitable system. And you have one where AI is not available to everyone. It actually is controlled by, highly, by, by, by a small number of entities, but this ends up producing a more equitable and stable economy nevertheless. Those are the two that are the most interesting ones to work out because they're the, the ones that we wouldn't have thought of before. So what I'll then ask students to do is to tell me what that world is like. You know, do, do, the, do the research, do the data, develop in as great as much of complexity as possible what that particular future would be like. So once again, it's constraints that's the issue. It's not about that I strongly believe that design does its best work in an emergency. Uh, not with a blank page. And so, you know, pick your, pick your emergency, ecological, financial, or securitarian at this moment, and we have plenty of going forward um, to kind of to work with. Now, one last point about the four square, just as another reason why I, I find it kind of interesting at this moment and why some of my undergraduate students, one of the reasons some of my undergraduate students seem to take to it so much is that, and some of you may know this, some of you may be part of this, this cultural already, is that, the, is that is on, on Instagram, there is this quite amazing subculture of, 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 of the use of Foursquare diagrams to map possible political ideologies um, that young people, usually between the ages of say 24 and 28, uh, 14, sorry, 14 and 28, quite young kids, will develop in order to kind of understand what's going on and what the future of the world might look like. It's not Shell Oil, it's not the Rand Corporation, it's people at your, it's people, you know, in our, people going to high school. And um, so here's just some, there's a fellow named Joshua Citarella who, who does a lot of research on this political gram stuff itself. And just as a way to sort of inspire us, get a little bit of sense of some of the work or, or the, that these kids have been doing. Um, some of them tends to be more, you, you to get a sense is like each of these, each of these oftentimes has this like very specific names attached to it, fully automated luxury ruralism, post-scarcity, neo-Victorian perma academia, 
interplanetary arcology monumentalism. Like these are supposed to constitute possible possible worlds, but also possible ideologies um, that might sort of work. The the acceleration versus deceleration is oftentimes one of this the, these kinds of things itself. Obviously, the video game dynamic here as well, but the diversity of both you know, in terms of, you know, sort of the class diversity of the participants here as well, the racial and ethnic diversity of, within this sort of thing is also quite admirable in terms of who, who's participating in this. And the fact that there is this, that this diagram, this diagram logic is being used in this kind of bottom up um, as, a, as a kind of folk theory, um, quite sophisticated and not sort of in, in any sort of the ways so is something that I find uh, quite amazing. Some of these are done by uh, people a bit older than than teenagers, but you get a little bit of sense of how this how this sort of works. So this is not what I'm expecting you necessarily to come up with here as well. Uh, I just wanted to show you uh, a little bit of what's a little bit of what's there, um, and so perhaps to argue for the relevance of this device, the the two by the the humble dull two by two device. Um, as something for us to sort of work itself out. So again, the question then, I'm going to hand this off to Stephanie now for us to, who will give you our, our, uh, the organization process here as well. It's not to come up with a solution, not to pitch an app, not to, but what does the, in essence, what does this circumstance of, of what should be the proper ethical framework by which a, public health governance in a pandemic and post-pandemic circumstance in the U.S. look like? What is the ethical framework? What are the conditions by which it would even define that problem in the first place? So what I'm asking you to do is to answer, think through that question or, or rephrase that question re, or turn that question around by using these, this sort of matrix of a strong sensing layer with subjective ethics, strong sensing layer with ethics of object, weak sensing layer with subjective ethics, weak sensing layer, what does each of those look like? And again, the, obviously there's no right answer to this question. I'm not asking for design artifact. I'm asking for a, basically a, a way in which that we all together can learn how to, we can find ways to ask this question better so that the design that we do is the, is the design that matters. So thank you for, for that. Um, I'm asked Stephanie now to take over and, and and tell us all what to do. Sure. Um, well, thanks, Benjamin. That was great. And um, we are these sessions are about half as long as they should be. So we ask you to forgive us in the accelerated um, version of everything. But we wanted to introduce you to a bunch of things. So what we're going to do is, I've we've prepared a simple Google slide with um, this this diagram set up, and we are going to put you into breakout rooms, probably about six people per room, and invite you to discuss this with the colleagues in your room, brainstorm, have examples. We recommend each, each team designate just a scribe and a facilitator to keep the conversation moving. We're gonna do that for about 15 minutes, just as an exercise to, to think through some of this stuff and then come back so that we can have ample time for a robust 30 minute conversation. So. It, it's going to feel really snappy, but um, that's all part of the fun. So if you have questions from the talk that are burning, I encourage you to write them down now, drop them into the chat or something, and we can pick that up also. But we want to like get all of that um, happening at the end of the session. So we are going to have, we're going to have seven rooms. Um, Okay, we'll have six rooms. Okay, and enjoy. See you in 15 minutes. Uh, one thing to say is that you're going to use the number of the slide that is part of your room. So that whatever breakout room you're in, that's the number of the slide that you should use. Okay, and you should be invited now to join a room. <laughs> 
Hey. Hi. Who is in room three? I I I managed to get um. Oh, I managed to get um Alex. Hey, Steph, can you hear me? Yeah. Are you okay. Did... Go ahead. You get Alex in the other room? Yeah. Okay, how, cool. How, how is it? How are they doing? It was good. We just, I just kind of talked, I just talked them through my notes of the two kind of the subject of ethics and ethics of the object. And I think, so it's Amy Alexander and um, someone named Adana, who I think is, somehow connected with the design lab or she was at that um, meeting with Don the other day anyways and they're they're started already starting to to populate the slide with some different ideas cool I'm looking like they seem like they're the only people who are writing stuff down though who doom scrolling okay somebody's adding something in there on um, slide three. Should I dive back into any one of these ones? Is there, what's? I mean, breakout room one is just so small, but I guess it has Amy Alexander, so it should be okay. Damn it. You should um, run out. Do you yeah. want to, okay, room six had Alex, room three had Alex. Do you want to check in on four? Yeah, four looks like it's just got one person. Can you can you assign me to four? Absolutely. Okay, go for and it. And when are we and when are we wrapping up? Two thirty? No, they have yeah, we're four more minutes of breakouts. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, so welcome back everyone. We are quite aware that we threw you into an exercise and it probably produced many more questions than it did answers and that's all part of this. So rather than uh, pitching what you came up with, although that's perfectly wonderful to start off the conversation, it's also equivalently great to just introduce what questions came up no matter how pragmatic or abstract. Does anyone want to start us off with what happened? We were group number one, so I guess we can start. And um, I don't know if I can share screen. I can. Oh, look at that. Um, so we were first trying to define what the categories were, like what it looked like. Um, ethics of the object as well as uh, subjective. So once we figured out what our governing body understand the nature of the problem versus not, how uh, is the, are the people being, you know, treated as like a, at a population level as objects interacting in the biological environment versus subjective, like individuals primacy, has primacy. And so we just, came up with some potential fact, like the South Korea model had a high level of, you know, population level implications and a high sensing level. Um, and the Florida model uh, did not really have a good sense of the sensing layer and was primacy, it was individualism. Um, and so we started to figure out like, who are these other categories? Like Los Angeles, did they have a, good population plan, but not a high level of sense of who was actually being infected or where the outbreaks were. And maybe that was the nature of the problem. And maybe San Diego was, you know, we had a pretty decent set, set of testing principles, but there was still a lot of resistance uh, as far as mask wearing and mask wars and whatnot. So uh, that might be a model, but that was a, probably the one we struggled the most with trying to come up with. So that's yeah, our it, one minute. It, it, yeah, it took, it took us a, a, a while, or at least me a while to, you know, wrap our heads around, you know, okay, what would this be? What would this be? And I thought it was interesting to, you know, to start thinking through different counties in California and, and try and think about the, their, their different responses, like, you know, San Diego Orange and Los Angeles and their different approaches to testing and the different, um, you know, resistance to this being on the subjective ethics or the uh, ethics of the object. And I think it, it, you know, when the time ran out, we were kind of just getting to that interesting place where we were trying to process that. So that's why there's, you know, a lot of question marks there because we just started to think, oh, this is interesting. Um, but yeah, it would be really interesting to extrapolate that to actually make it speculative and, and think more about, yeah, well, what would happen if we projected some places that are not, you know, the ones that are, that we know about or, or some imaginary hypothetical speculative places. Yeah, I like what you've done here with the, I, the trying to map this against the comparative governance kind of ma matrix by using, and this is well, I, I think a, 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 another version of this could be developed of, uh, of doing so with more, with, with, uh, more granularity, look at, looking at different countries, different cities, different yeah, other yeah. kinds of ways and trying to get a little bit of sense of, of how this might work out. And if you get very, if you define sensing layer in different ways and define the sort of the, the, an ethics as, a sub, as an act of subjective volition versus ethics as a sense of recognition of oneself as, a, as an object in relationship to others, as an egocentric versus allocentric, of course, there'd be different ways of doing that. But first getting a handle of like what worked and what really didn't work, um, both in terms of the policy level and at the level of the political cultural level, I think is one of the ways in which we definitely need, you know, get a handle on what, what, a, what a viable post-pandemic world looks like, so. Cool. Another did another group, even if they have like questions, what is sensing actually or, sure. or other thoughts that you had when, while you were working? 
Yeah, looking back, I think um, I did like the sensing. I didn't get as much like it didn't make as much sense as the other part, the ethics. Um, I'll sure, tell you. So I think I could define that it just to, make, to clarify this in this way. The sensing layer, as we're defining it here, would refer to any of the ways in which a society is able to, is, is able to, in essence, sense what is going on within itself at a collective level in order so that it is able to produce a model of itself that it can use to govern itself. So if you could think of it in terms of like climate change, We've got atmospheric sensors, we've got surface level sensors, we've got thermometers here, thermometers there, we've got ice core samples, we've got all kinds of things. All of these are sensing little bits of information, but they don't produce a model in themselves. After you sense all this stuff, you then have to produce a model, which then is a much more complex and abstract quantitative you know, object than any of these moments of, moments of sensation. And so what I wanted to argue is that as opposed to thinking about the sensing layer as like a bunch of smart city gizmos as, and, the opposite, and, and therefore the opposite of the kind of care that a social democratic healthcare regime would, would, would allow for us, actually think of them together. That the idea that, that people are, that access to testing, that access to, you know, being, uh, you know, to, to being diagnosed, to being, a, being and having a body that counts, is part of how it is a society with itself. So the sensing they refer to all the ways in which we are able to produce a model of ourselves that we can use to govern ourselves. Okay. Um, so ours, we were talking about taking more routine visits to the doctors. Um, and I thought that was like a sensing layer, but sure. th does it have to have an opposite polar end, like less visits? Because I don't even, I don't like, I couldn't think of reasons for that after the pandemic. Well, I, I think my, probably my first response to this would be having to do with, you know, the availability of this as well. I mean, part, part, I think what you maybe have identified here is the fact that there's such a strong differential, dif differential in access to healthcare. Yeah. Means, means that there's a differential, not only for how it is you or I might be, you know, have our temperature taken, sensed or diagnosed or treated in one way or another, but also how the entire population is able to sense and model itself. An inequitable healthcare system means you have inadequate models of the entire, of the entire social body, which, is, which, is collective, which, is, which exacerbates collective risk. Um, and so I think going to the doctor and having more contact with, that, with the medical institution is exactly right. And it only raises all the questions of like, why can't we do that? Why is that not happening? I mean, it's not happening for reasons that are, that are not technological, that are political and economic. Yeah, thank you. Sure. So I was part of group six and I don't know how to access the slide to show people if people wanna see what we came up with, um, but in the upper right quadrant, like the first group, we also had South Korea as a group that was, as a political, you know, a state which was both had good um, high sensing and the form of ethics which allowed people to actually think beyond themselves to the group. Um, in the lower left, we had the United States, which had abysmal testing at the level of the, of the country as a whole, and in which there's a lot of the ethics of subjectivity rather than thinking of the group. Um, in the upper left, we had Great Britain, because there's the National Health Service, which has a lot of data available, so high sensing, at least in general, um, but similar to the US has a lot of sense of sort of individual uh, that the individual has priority over the group as can be seen in brexit um, and in the lower right we had india which had very limited testing to begin with but at least people were focusing quite a bit on having the behaviors which would limit the, the spread of disease and as someone who actually works in epidemiology i want to point out that the 
um, upper left and the lower right quadrants are the ones where, from a clinical perspective, that's where you would intervene and do something. Because the people who are in the upper right are already doing everything that you want yeah. them to do, you know, in terms of thinking about risk. And the people in the lower left are the ones who you absolutely need to intervene on. So the question, the really interesting issues are to be, are the groups that are found um, in opposition to that, to that axis. So again, the upper left and the lower right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, no, no, it, it, I think an ex excellent use of this as well. Uh, Vietnam maybe is maybe another one of the examples for the bottom right where you had a, lo where a low degree of uh, sort of a low sensing layer, but a high degree of, uh, you know, for the kind of political and urban culture that allowed for uh, so higher, stronger degrees of mitigation in the sort of right as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that, the, you know, there's much to discuss here. Um, and, and I think the way in which you frame this is quite, is quite excellent. Um, I think probably the next step also is not, there's this sort of diagnostic aspect of this as well, but per, I think for me, part of this dynamic is, is for the next step here, a little bit on the design side and the speculative side is beginning to think about what, what a robust sensing layer really means, where it's not just more sensors uh, or, you know, putting sensors in your nose or getting everyone to use it on their phone or something where, where there's like, if there's more data points, more better, um, as a sort of a simple knob, but really to understand like what really what matters, what are the, you know, what in terms of this social equitability, the economic equitability and the ability of people like yourself to actually produce models that we can use. And then the other side is, is, is how, the kinds of reformations at the level of political culture that are necessary for those models to have efficacy, for those models to actually be used as political technologies that we that actually will have the effect that they should have. I mean, it's a, it's it is the same question that 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 is part of why you know uh, you know why, why in terms of the climate and governance and climate and governance in general. But I think the way in which you set it up here is, is quite excellent in terms of pointing, at least for me, in terms of pointing in the the really important directions. Well, I think something else that's important is to think about what data is being collected because just having right. data isn't sufficient. You need to actually yes. think about what is important data, what's what's necessary, what's useful. I mean, as the revolution in computing has occurred over these decades, we felt like, oh, we can just gather everything. And yet and yet it's it means that people aren't thinking about what it's what is it's worth relevant. collecting. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I totally agree. I mean I and I think that the implications of this are, are two are, are many folded. One of which is that, you know, there's you know Part, you know, the vernacular of data extractivism um, is, is one that I'm a little bit critical of because I think part of the thing you employ, it implies that data are, first of all, that are already out there, like strawberries, and we can just go get it. And also that once it's gotten, it's, it's not, it's like, it's been taken, like the way in which, like, you know, other things are extracted from territories that are removed from there as well. But to your point, data is produced in the act of modeling. Um, it's non-exclusive, like the same phenomena can, data can be produced about the same phenomena many, many, many times, depending on different ways in which it's measured, different ways in which it's qualified. And, and, and it's the non-exclusive qualities of the data that in fact point us in the direction of what data do we really need, as opposed to just the quantity issue. And it, I think it also implies why, to a certain extent, the discussions about taking back our data from large platforms, while I, I'm sympathetic to this, are inadequate because, frankly, the data that they've been gathering, like how do you predict what this primate is going to want to click on next to buy something, is not super relevant in terms of the kind of data we really need to govern ourselves. So it's not just that they have the data they need, we need and they won't let us have it. We don't have the data that we need because we've, producing, we've been producing the wrong data at enormous scale. Yulika, I don't know if you want to open up your comment or Ben, if you want to respond to Yulika's comment in the chat. What is the, I didn't look in the chat. Yeah, Yulika, maybe you want to just frame it if you, if you can turn on your sound. 
Okay, so the question of surveillance and rational liberalism. Yeah, so I, I think we might actually agree more than you, more than you, more than you think here. Um, to me, the problem with, I mean, I, I, I think many of this, and again, it's something that it's like, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to talk about where I, I feel as though I'm trying to be as precise and specific in the language that, that, that I'm using around this as much as, is, as the English language allows. And yet, I think the I think that the, the, our responses and frameworks around issues of of, of the sort of sense experience are so ingrained that I, I might be misheard to a certain to, to a certain extent. The argument I'm making is not that the forms of surveillance that we have now are okay, and actually that the emergency is such that we need to acquiesce to them and get over it. That is not what I'm saying. I'm suggesting actually that the forms of sensing that we have now are utterly inadequate to the question at hand and that the and that there are two problems one is that the forms of surveillance that we have now cause direct and pernicious social harm and two because we are not producing the data that we need to be producing in order to produce viable and equitable social models that we can use to govern ourselves the potential and real and necessary goods that a proper sensing layer would provide is being prevented, is being, is not able to appear. Uh, and, and, the, and it is the prevention of the sensing that we need that is the double danger of, the, of having the, survey, of the, the system that we have. Using planetary scale computation, again, to model what it is that primates are likely to want to see next on glowing glass rectangles is not the proper use of planetary scale computation. Climate science is the proper use of planetary scale computation. And we need to be looking closer to climate science as a model for how it is that we sense, model, and simulate human society and, and further away from these kinds of aver and further away from the, these kinds of aver the, the advertising models. So I think if your if your critique of the lip of the of this of, of the surveillance in that further context is one that I, I strongly share. Where there may be some disagreement, or where there's sometimes some disagreement with, with some of my colleagues, has to do with, um, I, I guess, in terms of the way I see it, I would take it a step further. And that part of the problem of the surveillance systems that we have now is that they're organized based on the idea that the most relevant thing for the understanding and modeling of human society is the modeling of individual persons and their interests and subjective desires. And I don't agree with this. I actually think that the most interesting things do not have to do with do not have to do with um, with, liber with with the sort of fortification and amplification of li of liberal subjectivity. Now, where that sometimes puts me at odds with some people is that part of the critique of surveillance is sometimes that it is an apparatus that is capturing a otherwise free individual subjectivity. It is curtailing the natural freedom of this individual subjectivity such that it is understanding society as primarily built up of individual self-sovereign individuals that are only later being captured by a collective apparatus in some sort of pernicious way. I think that in a way, the part of the problem of these systems, Facebook and the rest of the is the individuation itself. It's the definition of society as a system essentially made up of free and self-sovereign individuals that can be modeled in their themselves. That's the first problem. And to a certain extent, sometimes, again, this is where there's sometimes some disagreement where, where, um, where I share 90% of this, of the problem of the critique of surveillance systems as they exist now, I would want to take it a step further and say, really what we need is to disindividuate the the unit of analysis of this to where individ the idea of a self sovereign individual as somehow the base unit of society is is also uh, is is also set aside as opposed to refortified and liberated right like it's the old story that there's two books that people read when they're fourteen 1984 or Atlas Shrugged and they basically spend the rest of their lives not getting you know not being able to get one or one or the other out of their head both of them are stories of a kind of self sovereign liberal individual that has been in, that has been improperly captured by the demands of the collective and both of these are are, are mythologies that I think we need to we need to find we need to graduate from so I answered a question I don't know if I answered your question but you got there you go <laughs> 
Is there someone from group four has a ton of really interesting things on their side? If someone um, wants to chime in from that group. And in the meantime, Amy in the chat, Ben is asking how to create any trust that a system. Yeah, do you, do you want me to, to speak the question? I don't want to step on if group four is, that is would trying be great. to go. I mean, we'll see. Yeah, so I, I was just kind of wanted to follow up on, on what Benjamin was saying, because it seems like the, the problem is that no one trusts that such a system wouldn't be a, abused right and then we get all these reports out of china that you know hey actually they they're doing these sort of micro surveillance things and you know they'll see if you're talking in the quiet car in the subway and you'll actually get disciplined for that so how to create a system uh that anyone would, would trust would be used in an appropriate uh collective way yeah, no, there's, this is exactly, this is exactly the right question. Uh, it's, it's exactly the right question that we should be asking. And so if anything, I think if we can sort of shift, shift the direction to this kind of, shift the question towards what is, what is the, um, what is an understanding of how is, how is it that we should be producing equitable and accurate models of a societal whole so that we could back, act back upon it in ways that would amplify that equitability and ac ac amplify our rational capacities for self-composition that's exactly the right question that we need to be asking. And my suggestion is that a lot of the, 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 the calamities that have been dis disclosed and revealed by the, this pandemic are ones that very much point my thinking in that particular kind of direction. I, I don't, there isn't a simple answer to this question and there isn't a single answer to it as well. But I mean, we have some basic sort of thing, you know, again, you know, it's not as though we don't have models for how planetary scale computation, for example, is capable of producing enormously complex models by which the planet in essence is able to produce enormously complex models of itself that are deeply trustworthy. The question, this is what climate science is. And it is very much based upon the kind of, you know, Mer Robert Merton's norms of science of universalism, disinterestedness, organized skepticism, communization of data, so forth and so on. And this goes back, you know, almost a century in terms of these basic terms of this. Uh, in, in basic terms of how it is that you make a good how it is that you make a good model, um, the part of the question also I think is not just is that is is not just how do we make good models of the society that are accurate, but how do we learn to use those models to self govern ourselves in ways in which those models actually have can enforce their own implications, right? We can produce climate change models out to not seven decimal points, but 17 decimal points, but unless the implication of that model actually has the force of law or the force, even better, the force of actually transforming the, it can trans, the model can, can transform the phenomenon that it itself is modeling, they, 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 haven't, they haven't actually come into their own yet. So we need this recursive modeling to become part of the way we think about what governance even is. The other one, you know, financial systems, financial models are another way in which we have planetary scale computation that's producing enormously complex models of social behavior. And those do have recursive functions, generally negative ones, but they are, that the, the, it is financial models of how the economy works bend how the economy works, right? You know, McKenzie's an engine, not a camera. The model is actually producing its own reality. In a way, we would like climate models to produce their own reality in the way in which financial models do. Um, and I, it, but give, but thinking about the way in which the model becomes the siege of sovereignty rather than individual voice or even collective voices what requires a really a big rethink and even what we understand the political to be uh, in, one, in, in, in one way or another. And, and by all means, we can identify, I'm not trying to set China up as like, you know, you know, uh, we should, everything's okay. I sort of with China, I'm, I'm, what I was more suggesting the inverse of this, that that the kind of the orientalist, uh, that there's the, the, the part of the fear of technology becomes a fear of China, fear of China becomes a fear of technology, and that, uh, and that this ends up mobilizing all forms of kind of, of, of orientalist tropes and ways of thinking that are actually preventing um, the adequate understanding of what really is going on, right? I mean, I think a lot of technology criticism is based upon a criticism of what we imagine must be happening rather than what is actually is happening. And so what actually is happening goes uncriticized. 
and that's 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 not a good situation. So thanks for the question. But I mean, that's my general answer to a, a deeply important question. May I may I interject? This is yes. Brianka Chang. Can any can anyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, man. Okay. Yeah, Benjamin, it's wonderful. You know, I appreciate. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Brianko Chen from Amherst, Massachusetts. I have a question. You know, I just uh, having heard it's wonderful. Uh, let me uh, phrase my question real quickly. At what moment, or is there a uh, kind of a given a framework of relevance where the uh, the subjective ethics? You know, I'm thinking about agency. Yeah. You know, you, you were talking about the recursivity, you know, I mean, the yeah. stock markets, you know, and uh, I was, uh, uh, to what extent and in what way does that moment of subjective ethical uh, moment will, will come into play? And uh, given the kind of uh, these processes, you know, which with full of contingency, uh, the futures, how, yeah. you know, I, I'm thinking about, you know, how, how as a designer, Ultimately, well, that's just an ethical, not just an imperative, which is do and uh, try and test it out. Yeah. Am, I, am I making sense? You know, I'm trying to put the- Yes, I think so. I think the, qu yeah. the, qu the way I hear your question is, is right. really a question about agency uh, right. within these kinds of systems rather. And, and I guess part of what I was- I'm, I'm yeah, thinking about the experience, you know, one, you know, the, the idea of the experience will come back and haunt, you know, because of data, you know, I don't believe data, it's, it's, there's never yeah. anything, even data, yeah, it's constructed. Uh, yeah. So, Anyway, I, I should let you talk. Yeah. It's constructive, but so are the equality. Right. I mean, it, it, my argument is not to replace qualitative, qualitative insight with quantitative data and that, that, and that therefore somehow this will solve everything. By, 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 in no sense of, the, of, of this as well. I mean, my work if, if it is, is very much on the qualitative side of sure. this kind of, this qualitative side of equation. I, I mean, I think that the, the goal here, I mean, what, what's useful about these kinds of quantitative methods and even sort of the qualitative methods is they become, in essence, technologies of abstraction, that they allow us to form abstractions about phenomenon that we could, that we could not do on, in, in ourselves, right? You could, we could not find those patterns in that, much, in that much data because we don't sense the world that way. Mm -hmm. Right, you or I does not. We do not experience the world or sense the world in the same way the entire climate sensing apparatus senses the world. It is able to sense the world and essentially produce data about the way in which it senses the world that allows us to produce abstractions about the world that allow us to think qualitatively about the world in different in different kinds in different kinds of ways. Right, and yeah, so a moment of I, a, a moment of archive fever, right? Pretty much, no matter how you know how many planetary or otherwise, but the principle yeah. seems to be the same. Right, how much data is enough? Right, it's just a, a moment of you yeah, know, and, and, the archive fever. Right? It it is, but I would also go back to this early point someone make is is that it's not about quantity of data; it's about the quality yeah. and relevance yeah. of the data for particular kinds of things but also it is about it, it is it is about a context in which the models that the data produces the model abstractions that we can produce of the data can have agency and relevance so that they can transform the world in relationship to their implications and so you know we probably have enough data about climate change that's not the issue is really at this point it, it has less to do with, with with making even more precise models. It has to do with learning how to actually give those models agency that they would have as well. And so maybe another way of thinking about this, we're used to thinking about agency and subjectivity as almost inter, inter uh, as almost sort of inter, in, you know, interchangeable ideas. And I think we need to begin to sort of, and certainly begin to think about agency in terms of things that are non-subjective. The agency, the agency of models, the agencies of technical systems, the agencies of external systems, that the agency exists in different points within these complex systems. That's not, think of it like a, you know, like a Rube Goldberg machine, like you know, all sure. the sort of little parts falling apart. The agency in the system is not just whoever hits that first domino as, as it all falls down the line, right? Like how the system is set up it reverberates and agency radiates within this system in different kinds of ways. And I think if we focus on who is the first domino pusher along this cascade, and if we just get the right first domino pusher, then all of this would be okay. Um, I think that's part of why we're in the situation we're in is that we, is that we are, and again, are sort of thinking about agency entirely in terms of, in terms of the experience of our own subjectivity rather than in terms of the effects of of, of ourself as an effect in sort of these interrelations within the world. But again, part of what I'm talking about here, particularly in terms of 
the epidemiological models, the climatic models, the social models around this as well, is thinking about ways in which we can have a political culture in which models are equitable and accurate, and that they can have a they they have the capacity to enforce their implications. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, well, in the interest of um, time and appreciation for everyone today, I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Um, sure. And thanks everybody for joining us. Next week, we're gonna be um, having <coughs> a session with Pinar Yoldis um, and looking forward to seeing you all there. So I, I've also, um posted in the in the chat here I've given I'm giving my personal email uh, if anybody wants to follow up with me about any of this or send me links to just continue the conversation something that you think I should be looking at why well, I'd be very appreciative to sort of hear from each any of you on, on sort of where we take some of this we take some of this work into continuing the conversation in this context so uh, just Benjamin Bratton at gmail uh, right there as well so in any event please the, my, my, my inbox is uh, you know, drop into my DMs at any time and let's, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Greatly appreciated. Oh, no, my pleasure. Thank, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie, for organizing as well. Yeah, thanks. Yes, thanks. thank you, Steph. See you again soon. <laughs>